Uh, I would like to welcome Gretchen Wise. She is the Supervisory Park Ranger, Division of Interpretation, Education, and Visitor Services at Independence National Historical Park. And she is going to be leading a session today on how to design a site presentation. So let's give a nice uh, virtual round of applause to uh, Gretchen here. Um, you thank you for away. having me. I love talking interpretation. It's um, one of my favorite things to do. Uh, I, I Part of the reason I love talking about interpretation is because I really believe in what we do um, to help foster connections between these sites that we love so much and the visitors who come and uh, experience them alongside us. Um, I like that it's collaborative work. Um, you become a better interpreter when you surround yourself by good interpreters. And um, I really like that about interpretation. Um, I'm hoping to like kind of just do a basic Here's some things to think about uh, National Park Service interpretation wise, and then open it up at the at the back end to like just talk about your ideas and your thoughts on on interpretation and relevance and just kind of have a robust conversation. Um, you can interrupt me at any time. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And but I'm going to go ahead and say don't interrupt her at any time because we're <laughs> tour guides. And you don't, don't let them just go through your presentation and get through all your slides and then we'll do all the talking. And then we'll the do end. the talking. Okay. Sounds but Seriously, great. you won't sounds finish. Great. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So um, welcome to NPS Interpretation. Um, I will start by saying it, there's so much that we could talk about in interpretation that I've kind of tried to boil it down to some of like the key points that I think have helped me make a more targeted program. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, sorry, I'm hitting the wrong button and we're going to try this again. <laughs> Yay. Okay. I got it. Um, so the first three things we're going to really talk about is what is it, why do we do it and how does it work? Um, uh, interpretation is this idea that we are creating a space for vis visitors to engage and connect with our resource. And those connections can be intellectual and they can be emotional. They can be big, huge uh -huh moments and they can be teeny tiny little moments of connection and, um, ex and experience and inspiration. Um, but we are not forcing anybody to connect. We're just offering the space for them to connect with our, with our resources. Um, why do we do it? Research tells us that visitors are more like not just visitors, everybody, people are more likely to want to protect and conserve the things that they feel connected to. Um, and in that vein, conservation is the foundation of the National Park Service. It's like right there in our founding legislation. The Organic Act of 1916, which created the National Park Service says, to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife that they're in and to provide for the enjoyment of the same in such manner and by such means, as we leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. And so that idea of conservation is baked into the identity of the National Park Service. And we know that visitors are more likely to get behind the conservation of these special places if they feel connected to them. So we do interpretation so that people will want to help us protect and conserve. Um, and then the big question, how does it work? Um, I believe that there are kind of four guiding principles to interpretation. And in order to talk about them, we're gonna talk about them in kind of, we're gonna talk about them in order, but we're gonna go back and forth a little bit. So we're gonna start with Tilden. Um, Tilden is the grandfather of National Park Service interpretation. Everybody who works in interpretation in it right now, the work that we do was, the foundation was built by Tilden. And he had kind of six principles that guided the way that he interpreted the resources for visitors. And he taught those principles to the next generation who taught it to the next generation and so on until they got to like our generation of interpreters. The first of his six principles is this idea that if you can't relate what is being displayed or talked about to the experience of the visitor, the program will be sterile. So um, if you're just 
presenting visitors with history, but we're, you're not relaying that history to what they're experiencing in their everyday lives, they're not going to connect. It's going to be, it's just going to, it's going to fall flat. Um, his next principle is my personal favorite. Information is not interpretation. <laughs> my boss, Jason Ginder, the chief of operations here at Independence National Historical Park, he loves to tell people during interpretive trainings, he's, he says, and I quote, I don't care if the visitor learns anything. <laughs> um, which causes some problems. I'm not going to lie. Our interpreters have this like knee jerk reaction to this idea of like, what? Our visitors don't have to learn anything. Um, and it's not that Jason's saying that the, the transition of information from me to you and from you to me isn't important, but information in and of itself is not interpretation. Yes, your programs are going to include the transfer of knowledge, but that is not what makes the program interpretation. The transfer of knowledge that creates a connection is what makes it interpretation. So um, it's okay if visitors walk away and they haven't learned anything, but they've felt something, that's okay. That's still interpretation. Um, I take umbrage with this one. Interpretation is an art and art is teachable. Art is not teachable. I took art. I know that you can't learn it. You either have some skills or you don't. Like, I understand art and I understand the concepts of art, but please don't put a charcoal in my hand and ask me to create something that looks like something. My cat will look like a dog and a horse and a zebra and a giraffe all at the same time, right? So I actually believe that interpretation is science because Science has very specific principles. And so if you take all of the pieces of an interpretive program and you put them in the right order, at the end of it, you get you get something interpretive, right? Just like if you take all of the all of the things that create a scientific experiment experiment and you put them in the right order, at the end, you're going to have this result. So I believe that interpretation is a little bit more science than art. I think you can do it artistically, but because art for me was not teachable, I take a little umbrage to this principle of Tilden's. <laughs> um, the, chief, and the chief aim of interpretation is not instruction, but provocation. So going back to that idea that Jason says all the time, I don't care if people learn something, that's because we are not here to instruct, we are here to provoke. And sometimes I think prov provocation gets like, um, a bad rap because it's we're not here to like necessarily cause people to be angry or hurt or, or whatever, but we can provoke connection. We can provoke emotion. We can provoke feeling something. We can provoke people to take action. And that is what our goal is. If we want people to buy into the idea of these beautiful resources that we have and conserve and protect them for the future generations, we need to provoke them to act right? Um, interpretation should aim to present a whole rather than a part. This is a little bit of a hard one. So I'm just going to ask that you remember this for when we get further on in the presentation and we talk about independences, um, our specific interpretive themes, because I think this reveals itself when you start digging deeper into the resources themselves. So we're gonna come back to this idea of the whole rather than the part. And then the last of Tilden's, um, the last of Tilden's uh, principles was this idea that if you are creating a program that's specifically for kiddos, you don't take the program that you created for adults and just use smaller words. You start from scratch and create a program that is specifically targeted towards that age group and that level of emotional maturity, right? So um, it should be a fundamentally different approach to program creation. Generally speaking, and I'm guessing this is true for, for all tour guides, generally speaking, we don't, we don't do programs here that are just for kids, right? We have this diverse audience. We might have two months old, two month olds. We might have 12 year olds. We might have 20 year olds. We might have 82 year olds, right? So we're not usually doing programs that are just for kids. But if you know that you are doing a program that is just for kids, it should be 
created for them in mind and not just a dilution of a program for adults. So with those guiding principles in mind, this is how the science of interpretation works with the interpretive equation. It's not math. If it was, I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, but, <laughs> but this is our interpretive equation. Ka plus Kr plus Ks times At equals Io. And we're gonna take each of these little bits and pieces in, in, in sections and talk about what they are and what they mean. So the first thing, actually, I'm going to start in the middle with KS. KS means knowledge of self. The most, one of the most important factors in interpretation is the interpreter. You have to know what gets your motor running, what inspires you, what stories you love to tell, the things that you want, the, the knowledge that excites you. You need to know that. Um, I came to Independence from Zion National Park. Zion National Park is an international dark sky park. And the thing that excited me most to share with visitors was our dark skies. I loved to hang out with visitors under a brilliant a full moon and just enjoy all of the all of the different ways that the canyon looked under that lighting. I love to do star programs and talk to them about astronomy and about inspiration and about the inner workings of the greater universe that we can see. I loved to um, show the Hercules cluster in a microscope because it looks like a little fuzzy cotton ball in space. And it, I was always just so excited to be able to talk dark skies and stars and the moon with visitors. And that enthusiasm that I had for that subject matter wore off. And I received more feedback, positive feedback about the ways that that program connected visitors to dark skies and to something bigger than themselves than I did about any other program. And it was because of my enthusiasm for the subject matter. Your, the knowledge of you and what gets you going is so important to the interpretive equation. You have to talk about what you're excited about. Um, <clears throat> KR is knowledge of the resource. So Independence National Historical Park, our resource is history. <laughs> Um, and there's a lot of ways to learn, to gain the knowledge of the resource. I talked about the collaborative nature of, of interpretation, and we learn so much from each other about the stories of independence and the, and the, the um, stories of the revolution and the stories of the founding, uh, the founding fathers and the founding generations. But there are other ways to get that knowledge. Like we have a whole cultural resources division that you can reach out to and they will point you down the exact rabbit hole that you need to get to, to get to all of the things you want to know. Um, and we have something called a long range interpretive plan, which is part of this presentation. So we're going to move on from knowledge of the resource so we can talk about that long range interpretive plan in detail a little bit, a little bit further on. But you take the knowledge that you have of yourself, what you really love, and then you go and you learn about the resource that gets you more excited. And then you move on to knowledge of the audience. And what can we say about our audiences? <laughs> They're human. So we can make some very kind of um, basic and general assumptions about, about the visitors that we're gonna see. One of the assumptions is that um, they are all somewhere along this hierarchy of needs. Um, so we talk a lot about Maslow's hierarchy of needs is in, in interpretation because in order to get to an interpretive product, which resides at the top of the hierarchy in that self-actualization area, you first have to take care of the deficiency needs. So the physiological needs and the safety needs are what we call deficiency needs. If you haven't slept well, if you are hungry, if you don't feel well today, if you are, um, if you don't feel safe, if you don't know where you're staying tonight, if you got mugged at the airport, you know, that sort of thing. Even in the terms of love and belonging, so many visitors get to our park and they are on 
a 10, they're on day nine of a 10 day family vacation and they're ready to like murder each other. Um, so those are deficiency needs. If you're deficient in the needs at the bottom of the hierarchy, you have no, there is nothing that an interpreter can do to kind of get you up to the top of the hierarchy. So visitors have to kind of be prime for us to, to be able to help them along the interpret to interpretation. Um, so we, we do our best at the visitor center to make sure they know where the bathroom is and know where to park and they, they have some basic orientation. Maslow's hierarchy of needs actually uh, uh, speaks to this spectrum. So we call it the interpretive spectrum and it's, it's, it works just the way the hierarchy does. That little O stands for orientation. So visitors get here and they have tons of questions like, where's the bathroom? Where can I park? Where do I go to show my ticket to get into Independence Hall? I hear there's something called the printing office. Where is that? Where do I, make, I meet my tour guide for this thing that I'm supposed to do? Once they have figured all that out, now they're ready for the, the little eye information. They're ready to learn a little something like, when was Independence Hall built? Tell me about the Free Quaker Meeting House. Um, who's this dude, Thomas Jefferson, and what do I really need to know about him, right? And once some of their curiosity has been taken care of, then they can move along to the I, which is that connection piece. But just like Maslow's hierarchy, where people are, are gonna go kind of up and down along the hierarchy, depending on what's happening physiologically and safety, people are gonna move back and forth along the spectrum. You might have your tour totally primed and eating out of the palm of your hand and they're about ready to make connections. And then the five-year-old has to pee. And that takes them all the way back to the beginning and they need to be oriented again and be ready to be primed again for interpretation. So what we know about visitors is they're in a constant state of flux, right? And we need to be able to speak to that state of flux and keep them moving in the right direction along the spectrum. The other things that we know about visitors actually come to us from an organization that has done a lot of research into um, cultural entities like museums and zoos and planetariums and places like Independence National Historical Park. And they there's a book and a web page and a blog called Know Your Own Bone. And that research has shown us that these three things are more important to the are the most important to visitors when they are deciding what they want to do with before what who a visitor chooses to participate in an activity with is more important than the activity themselves so i plan a fun night out with my girlfriends and we go mini golfing the most important part of that activity is the fact that we are together the mini golfing takes second stage we could have just as much fun if we stayed home and ate banana pudding, or if we went to a used bookstore and bought all the books that David just dropped off, <laughs> right? <laughs> so with who you are doing something with is more important than what you are doing. The same research also tells us that visitors wanna be entertained, which isn't to say that it has to be all like glitter and unicorn and woo woo party all the time, but they want to feel engaged in the experience. They don't want to feel like the experience is happening around them. They want to feel like they are part of it, that entertainment. And then the third thing that the visitors care about is the value. And it's not just like getting the most bang for your buck, although obviously in today's, in, in this day and age, cost is going to be a factor but there's also an opportunity cost. For everything that a visitor decides they're going to do, they are giving up something else that they could do. And so they want to feel that their time is well spent and that their energy is well spent along with their money being well spent. These are things that visitors care about when they're deciding how to, how to spend their time and what to do with it. So, there's a couple of other things that we can know and assume about our audiences. And the first, and one of those things is that they're diverse. Probably the most important thing is that they're diverse. Um, we are in an age 
where there are four generations in the workforce. We have baby boomers, Gen Xers, Gen Ys, those are the millennials, and the Gen Zs. And very, very soon, we're going to be welcoming the, the alphas into the workforce. And that's just the workforce. When visitor, when people are visiting, we are seeing huge multi-generational families. We're seeing, every, like I said before, everything from two-day-old babies to 100-year-old um, sages. And so we know that we have a huge age diversity in our visitation. We also have a huge uh, ethnic and cultural diversity in our visitation. Here at Independence, we get visitors from all over the world, right? And we know that. And there are certain seasons where you can count on seeing the French and seeing the Italians and seeing the Germans and seeing the folks from Asia. Like we, we can kind of set our calendar by who is coming from the, wor the world over. Um, we know that we have a big socioeconomic divide um, in our visitation because national parks are um, cost effective ways to get out of your house and do something as a family. We know that we have a big, uh, a big socioeconomic divide. And then we also have an educational divide. We, as we well know, uh, in the spring, we're gonna have fourth graders and fifth graders and junior hires and high schoolers and teachers and educators and um, college professors and college students. And, you know, the average adult who isn't working in, um, in a, and uh, how do I say this, in an educational situation, likely kind of thinks along the term of an eighth grader. I know that sounds crazy, but when we write things, we write for an eighth grade audience. So we we know we have these educational divides as well. Knowing that about our audiences just helps us be more targeted in what we are doing and what we are presenting. Knowing that we have age differences, cultural differences, language differences, educational background differences, we need to take the, the product that we are creating and make sure that everybody can understand, which isn't doesn't mean we dumb it down so much that people who know more are gonna be frustrated, but we also can't talk so high that people who don't know as much are gonna give up, right? Now we take all of that and we multiply everything that we've just added together by AT, which is appropriate techniques. And techniques are what set aside a lecture, which is kind of what I'm giving you tonight, apologies, from an interpretive program. Techniques are what help you reach all of the different learning styles that might come to your program. Um, I'm a kinesthetic learner. Uh, I learned through doing. So <laughs> full disclosure, I was a dance major in college, not a history major, not an education, not an education major. I was a dance major. I had a terrible time learning through um, lectures and through reading. It, it's just not how I do things. My high school geology teacher told my parents, because I was failing his class, told my parents um, in a, in a, uh, a parent teacher conference. If I could teach your daughter geology through her feet, I would, but I don't know how to do that because he understood that it wasn't that I wasn't, I couldn't learn. It was that he didn't know how to teach me the way I needed to learn. So appropriate techniques is this idea that you sprinkle in a little something for every type of learner. So, you know, there are going to be people who want the facts. So you're going to give them the facts. But then you're going to be, you know, there are going to be people who are drawn by language. So maybe you, you put in a beautiful quote, right, to kind of tie things together for them. You know that there are going to be people who are just going to be antsy and getting bored. And so you make sure that you move, you move from place to place relatively quickly. You know that there are going to be people who want to participate. So you sprinkle in some open-ended questions so they can, they can talk to you and they can talk back to you. Appropriate the A in appropriate techniques is important because it's not just doing it for the sake of throwing a bunch of different things at the wall and seeing what sticks, but you, you use the techniques to enhance your program and to enhance the visitor experience within the program. 
So that's why the A is there. If it was just about techniques, we could all do a bunch of crazy stuff and people would be fun with it. Um, I, toy I, I had to do it for a person who almost failed geology. I had to do a geology program at Zion because it's a big rock park. And um, my geology program was about how canyons are carved. And um, the first time I gave the program, my supervisor came and she coached me and I referenced a song, Deep and Wide, Deep and Wide. I don't know if you know it, it's something we sang in Sunday school. And I referenced a song and she said, you know, I think that would be more effective if you sang it. And I said, well, I don't, I don't wanna sing just cause like, that's my thing. Cause I also, I love theater, jazz hands. And um, she said, no, you should, you should try it. So I got out my ukulele and I taught myself the chord progression. And at the end of my program, or at the end of that part of my program, I said, and now we're gonna sing. And I taught the audience the song, Deep and Wide, Deep and Wide, Zion Canyon's been carved deep than wide, right? And we laughed and we had a good time and everybody sang. And while that was probably silly to a lot of people, I did have folks come up to me afterwards and they were like, thank you for speaking my language, right? So it didn't, it maybe didn't connect with everybody, but it connected with enough people that it was worthwhile me keeping it in there. So it's just something to think about. So now you take all of those disparate things together, you mash them up in a blender. And what that leads to is this IO, interpretive opportunity. And that's the end game. The end game is this chance for people to connect with the subject matter, with an idea that you presented to them, with something that they can walk away from and say, say, gosh, I didn't know that, or gosh, I didn't realize, or my Lord, I never looked at it that way. And they can then, you know, use that little bit of connection to provoke them to action, that action that we're going for, which is the conservation and preservation of those places. So we go from, we've done Tilden, we've done the interpretive equation, and now let's talk about specific things to independence, which is our long range interpretive plan. Um, the long range interpretive plan is something that every park has to create, and it outlines why the park cre was created, who enabled it, because that's not necessarily always Congress, depending on, you know, there's 400 and, 20 some odd units in the National Park Service and some all of them came into being some weird way. Uh, outlines the mission of the park, the goals, the vision statement, et cetera, and so forth. And then it gives you this, the park's interpretive themes, which are statements about what the, the stories basically that the park is going to tell and focus on. And I gotta tell you, they're huge. They're very general. We're gonna go through them, but you can see you'll, what you'll notice in all of these is that one thing that you're super passionate about, there's room in all of these things for that thing. So the there are four of them total. The first one is what was revolutionary about the revolution, about the American Revolution? Um, this is a theme that I think speaks directly to Tilden's first principle, which was that idea, unless you are making it relevant to the experience of the person who's standing right there is gonna fall flat. So the American Revolution happened 250 years ago, almost, right? We're almost to the semi-quincentennial. Um, and so we need to help people find relevance in the stories of the American Revolution still today. How does what happened 250 years ago affect them to this day? That's how we create relevance. So what was revolutionary about the revolution is that it still, it still affects the way we think about um, the rule of law and our rights and our freedoms and our liberties to this day. And so that's, that's the first interpretive theme of independence. Interpretive theme number two, liberty, the promises and paradoxes. This is the theme that I think speaks most to that um, Tilden's, uh, Tilden's idea number five, which I said is a really hard one, this idea of like, you have to talk about the whole, not just a part. And liberty, the promises and paradoxes really speaks to that because if all we do is talk about the promises of liberty, we're leaving half of the story out because 
that proclaim liberty throughout all the land that's written on the Liberty Bell, the founding generation left a lot of people out of that. The founding fathers left a lot of people out of that liberty. Where was the liberty for the slaves? Where was the liberty for the women? Where was the liberty for all of these people who are not wealthy white male landowners, right? Now we've, we've, we've made a lot of strides as Americans in that way. And the promises and paradoxes, having the paradoxes in there gives us a chance to talk about the abolitionist movement. And it gives us a chance to talk about the suffragist movement. And it gives us a chance to talk about the civil rights movement and the things that came after the founding generation, but are still integral to who we are as Americans today. So that liberty, the promises and paradoxes speaks to that idea of that Tilden said, you've got to address the whole, not just a part, right? Um, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. Um, and I love this scene because, again, for me, it's all about collaboration. And um, this, this is about the collaboration that it took to get us from colonists to, uh, to our own free nation, to a whole new way of doing government, and to the... Uh, way we still do government to this day. So out of many, one, a lot of voices that create one big, beautiful mess that is the United States of America. And then the final theme is Ben Franklin. And <laughs> the reason I love the Ben Franklin theme is because, you know, we talked about that diverse audience. Um, along with all of the other ways that our audience is diverse, they all have their own unique interests. And by God, if Ben Franklin probably didn't have one of their interests as well, right? He was a philosopher and an inventor and a, and a statesman and a printer and an entrepreneur. And so there's a, there, I feel like there's a story in Ben Franklin that can relate to every single visitor who comes to our park if we just take the time to get to know our visitors a little bit, okay? So those are our park interpretive themes. So we've done the first four, I, the first three of the four ideas to guide us. And then the, the last little bit is this like modern interpretive approaches. A word about this. I don't love it. Okay. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to present it to you. And, and then I'm going to tell you why I don't love, I don't love the modern interpretive approaches. We have in the park service struggled with the idea that we have to innovate. And so in the last 10 or so years, we've come up with a lot of like buzzwords around new ways to do interpretation. 21st century interpretation, ACE, which stands for audience-centered experiences. Co-creation and shared authority are some of those kind of buzzwords. And really what they all what they all boil down to is this idea that um, we provide space for the visitor to create their own experience. And we are just, um, this is the part that I hate. Uh, I, there's a lot of people who really love this idea of modern interpretive approaches. And they say to those of us who stick to Tilden, Stop being the sage on the stage and start being the guide on the side. I don't know if you've heard that, but that's the thing. This idea that if you're the sage on the stage, you're doing it wrong. And if you're the guide on the side, you're doing it right. And I take umbrage to that because ultimately all of the idea of the modern interpretive approaches and the shared experience and the, and the shared authority actually goes right back to the first principle that Tilden ever taught us. And that is that any interpretation that does not relate what is being displayed to the experiences of the visitor will be sterile. And the only way to really understand the experiences of the visitor and help relate what you're telling them to their experiences is to talk to them and to ask them questions and to get to know them a little bit better so that you can help them um, make those connections and see how, how what you are telling them relates to their experience. So 
the modern interpretive approaches aren't actually throwing Tilden out. They're just talking about Tilden in a totally different vernacular. And I don't have a problem with that, except that we should be allowed to use all of it in order to help our visitors make a connection to the park. So when we talk about audience-centered experiences, what is that really? It means talking to your visitor, learning a little bit about them so you can help them experience the resource on, on their terms. It means giving them some air in your program to share with you a little bit about what makes them tick. You know all about you and you are excited about your subject matter, giving them a chance to tell you what excites them about the subject matter so you can like connect on that level. So the modern interpretive approaches aren't actually in, um, in uh, defiance of Tilden. If you use them correctly, they are celebrating all that Tilden actually taught us. And one of the things that we know from everything that we just talked about is the probably the most important thing to the modern audience is relevance. And how do we make what, what we have here at Independence National Historic Park, the resources that we have and the history that we share, how do we make it relevant to what our visitors are experiencing today? And that is where I'm gonna stop talking and I'm gonna stop sharing my video and so that we can talk together about this idea of relevance and what it really means. So I think, why don't we, if anyone has a question, if you use the raise hand feature, cause there's a lot of you, it's at the bottom of your of your Zoom screen, uh, use the raise hand and then we can, we can do questions. I see Bill is, Bill is clapping there. Thank you, Gretchen. It's wonderful. You, We're not quite done yet. She's yeah. still going to talk to us a little more. Mm -hmm. I can give one question. I had a question from somebody who had to leave. Yeah. Um, he said, uh, how would Google have changed Tilden's philosophy? Well, that's interesting because um, I think what Google has done for us just in general is I don't have to have all the answers anymore. So I'm not a historian. Full disclosure, dance major, okay? So I can count to eight and I know how to dance. Like, let's let's talk jazz hands. I'm not, I'm not a historian, nor was I a geologist. Um, but what Google has done is allowed me to not have to have all the answers. So if I'm over in Independence Hall and someone asks me a question about either what happened in that space or to that space after what happened in there, and I don't know the answer, I can be perfectly honest and say, you know, I don't, I don't actually know the answer to that, but I bet you could Google it and find out. And then I can move them off of needing to know that information and, and, and then talk to them about why they want to know that and how that affects how they feel about the place, right? Because it's not about knowing everything there is to know. It's just about helping, about understanding why visitors want to know it, you know? So I think that Google has given us more freedom to not have to be the subject matter expert in the history, whereas we can just be the subject matter expert on how to interpret the history. Does that help or make sense? Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Someone, Richard. Unmute yourself and I'm, lay it on us. Unmute, unmute. Okay. So I'm sorry, I, I could not join uh, as, as soon as you started, I joined midterm. But here's my question. Sure. Relevance is really so important, but where do you see the dividing line between relevance and editorializing? Mm. Yeah, uh, we. I think we talk a lot about that because we, um, I, when I do a training, I do a train, I do a much more intense training for like new seasonals and new hires. And I kind of equate being a bad interpreter to being a bad boyfriend. I'm sorry to the males um, or being, <laughs> being a bad partner because a bad partner is going to be emotionally manipulative. And as interpreters, we don't want to be emotionally manipulative. We're not here to tell them how to feel. 
we're here to give them space to feel, right? So we want them to draw their own conclusions. They, we want people to have their own, their own ideas and their own feelings. And, it's, and it, I think it's incredibly challenging at this park. It was a lot easier at Zion, right? Everybody thought it was beautiful, right? Like there wasn't much of me having to like lead the horse to water there. This park is different. It sparks a lot of emotions for people. We have, we like, let's be honest. We know we live in a very like politically divisive time and that comes out while people are here. And it's hard to kind of remain neutral and allow people to feel their feelings. But I think that it's really important to allow them space to create their own relevance and try not to like uh, force them into a specific corner or stance or whatever. It's a fine line. The, the, uh, if, if I may continue with that line, yeah. when I'm talking about, for instance, uh, Congress Hall, and I've made the point that there was a peaceful transfer of power for the first time, and there was no rioting in the streets, and no, no, uh, you know, dissent. I've and actually had just walk home. off my tour. Yeah. The simple mention that that was a historic fact, and I'm thinking, I, I can't, I can't sugarcoat that. That is what right. happened. It's interesting that you bring that up. I had someone come to me just recently and ask the same question and and ask if they should take it out of their program. And the bottom line is you are presenting them with a fact. Mm -hmm. you, you didn't tell them how to think about it. And if they walked off their tour, you provoked them. They, they got, to, wherever they got to, they got there on their own. You can't necessarily be responsible for the result, but it would be irresponsible to take away that super important fact of history just because it's hard right now. Absolutely, sure. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Charlie? Hey, here we go. Hey. Hi, Gretchen. Uh, How are I'm you? Uh, injured reserve now. I'm going to come back after the first year. When I'm, <clears throat> my back is a little bit better. <clears throat> Several of us uh, last February went through that uh, uh, audience uh, center uh, experience, the ACE training, you know, uh, and yeah. uh, the engagement. And what is the level of commitment? I, I thought all the Rangers everywhere were going through that. Is there yes. a solid commitment to moving forward with that? I mean, I'm much more comfortable as you are with Tilden. Well, sorry, it's just really hot. I had to do that. I apologize. <laughs> um, you know, that's a good question. The bottom line is we want everybody to be open to giving visitors space to participate in the program. So, you know, there are a lot of audience-centered techniques that are not new. Things like open, open-ended questions and like, um, you know, assessing the audience. You know, what do you know about this? What do you know about that? You know, getting them to vote. You know, I, I don't do an Independence Hall program, I wanna be clear, but if I ever had to do one, in, I, I know that I would um, force everybody to pick sides. You can be an, a loyalist, you can be a patriot, or you can be in the middle so that we could talk about how not everybody was into the war, right? And so I think that um, there are ways to take a program that is already built and just inject a little bit of that audience-centered experience into it to create what is a more modern approach. I use that term really loosely. We're committed to making sure everybody knows what ACE is and how to do it. And we are committed to asking people to do it at their comfort level. Mm. So like, Charlie, if you're comfortable with open-ended questions, good for you. Good on you, mm. do it. Do you know what I mean? But you don't ever have to get to a point where you're like leading an interpretive dance about the American Revolution. Mm. That's extreme. No one would do that. But you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Cindy. Hi, thank you. This was great. I guess I should show my face. I don't have to show my face. Anyway, you thank you. It looks yeah. very bad today. It's <laughs> raining. My hair is a mess. So my question is, when I do, okay, 
sometimes I'm lucky enough to have what I call the cheat list in that if people come to me directly, specifically from the internet, let's say an email, I will ask them before I set something up. I have more control of asking if it's adults, what their occupations are. If it's mm -hmm. a school group, is it performance? What type of performance? Mm -hmm. When I'm working for others, I don't always have that luxury. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, well, I guess it's twofold. In your position and what you do with the programs and everything, which is great, do you have a heads up who's in your group? And if you don't, is, oh, okay, is, I could tell by your face, okay, <laughs> you are into art, you just don't know it. <laughs> um, I guess my question is, is there a certain kind of way, I'm not saying leading people, but with regards to relevance, which is very important, obviously, um, you mentioned that. Is there a certain, let's say, question or quick series of questions or an introduction mm. that you recommend for, let's say, if it's a group of adults or if it's a group of kids with chaperones, student groups? Is there an easy way to bring them in right away and to give you a heads up more of what is relevant to them? I I don't think you should be afraid of just putting it out there. I don't. I don't think that anything we do should be a sneak attack. I think it's okay to say <laughs> to like the teacher, That's hey, a good... <laughs> you know, like, tell me what's relevant to your group. I really want to make this, I really want to make this special for them. I really want to make this meaningful for them. I think it's okay to say to the people in your group, hey, you know, the, the National Park Service is concerned. The, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, organization that I work for is concerned about making sure that you you get what you want out of this uh, this experience. So tell me tell me what makes you excited about visiting. Tell me what you think is relevant about our story so that you can dive deeper into oh. it. Um, we're not we're not interpreting in secret. <laughs> right? Right. No, thank you. That's helpful yeah. actually. Yeah. Wording it that way. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else? Nope. I would ask, do you think, can you give us an example maybe from your own um, experience or maybe one of the other rangers you've worked with of, of an example of like a quick story that may like that made this connection? Like, so we could see an example of kind of like talking about the yeah. park in a way that makes a connection. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think. Uh, I, I go to so many programs because I have to, like, I don't mean it like that. It's my job to go to, to, go to people's programs as a supervisor. And I'm, and like, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I have a very strong connection to the printing office. Mm -hmm. Um, and the demonstrations that are done there and the stories that are told there. And uh, part of that is because I, like many of you who I see on this video, really like books. And so the written word is special and important to me. And um, so I, I have a strong connection to that story. And I really, um, almost everybody in their demonstration at some point gets around to the idea that America would never have happened without the printing press. And mm -hmm. for me, that is one of the biggest connections that I, I feel how that story is so relevant then because I, I love books and I love the written word. And I just, I often just think of the written word as entertainment, right? We were talking about what would you have liked to do on this rainy day? Stay at home with a lap, a cat on my lap, drinking tea and reading a book, right? And I think of, I think of the written word as a form of entertainment, but the story that is presented at the printing office is that the written word is a form of protest. And that for me is, is an, is an amazing idea. And it was a new idea for me when I, when it was presented to me at the printing office. Um, one other thing, this is not related to this park, but I'll also mention it because I come from a geology park and I told you about how I almost failed high school geology. Um, 
it was my first season at Canyonlands National Historical Park and we were touring the park with a geologist and she was talking about all the geology and all of it was just like <laughs> flying right over my head. But towards the end, she held up her arms like this. And she said, if all of geologic time is spans from my the left, the tip of my left middle finger all the way to the tip of my right middle finger, humanity is just the epidermis over here. And it brought into very fine relief how we are just a blip on the geologic time scale. And that gave me something to glom onto that I could then use to relate to my visitors. Cause I was like, I'm never gonna remember all of this rock formation and you know, particulate matter. Um, so sometimes it's as simple as that just teeny tiny little idea that sparks something. So those are two examples. Does that help? Okay. okay. Ralph. <laughs> uh, hi, thanks. Uh, this has been uh, great, Gretchen. Uh, it's kind of a follow up to the question that Marianne asked about some little thing. You know, all the founding fathers, as you mentioned, were all white, affluent, you know, landowners. I always want to throw in something about a woman who was, you know, part of the history of, of our revolution that never made the history books. Uh, little simple stories. I, I like to tell the story of uh, Sally Franklin Bache and how she, you know, she, she sewed 2,200 shirts to be given yep. to Washington's men during the revolution because mm -hmm. that's what they needed. And, you know, I like to look at the, the little girls in the audience and look at their eyes as you as you talk about that. And and I think it's a very simple way to not only make a connection with some people, but to, uh, you know, inject a little uh, a little bit of that, as you say, that the part that we don't talk about a lot, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's a that's a good story too to to keep to to also relate to today. Like you can't do everything, but you can do us every everyone can do something, right? Mm -hmm. And so even the even what might seem like the most insignificant task is huge to someone. Those soldiers who got her shirts were blessed, right? And so like that's another way to like relate that to, you know, because sometimes I just feel so useless. Like, what do I do? I talk to people all day, right? <laughs> but everybody. You can't do, no one person can do everything, but everyone can do something. And that's a story of that right there. Richard. I bet you have a favorite story about Benjamin Franklin and I want to hear it. You know, I, I don't think I do. Okay, so I'm going to tell you the truth and this is not about Ben Franklin at all, but um, you all have been in the Ben Franklin Museum? Sure. Yeah. Okay. And you've all um, experienced the horror that is the gout video. Mm, it's been no? years, okay. so. so Ben Franklin, like the, the, the voice of Ben Franklin is going on about his gout, but it always starts with this like, oh, 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 like these like painful noises. And like, I hadn't been here very long when I got a call that the gout video was acting up and it was that the, the sound was going, but the video wasn't. And so like people would just be walking by and hear Ben Franklin going, ow, ow. I was like, what do you want me to do about that? I don't know how that works. He's alive, he's alive. I, I was like, good luck. Like that was that was my response. I'm like, I've been here like three weeks. I'm like, good luck to you. Have a great day at the Ben Franklin Museum. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Marianne, you're muted. Oh, I was just gonna say anybody else? No more, no more questions. No, but I'd like to say thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for doing what you do. You know, uh we it takes a village to do what we do, and you are all part of that. So thank you so much for doing it, for wanting to learn more about it, for having me here tonight. I really, I really had a good time and uh, 
enjoyed putting this presentation together because it's a different way of presenting it that I've ever done before. So thank you for being my guinea pigs. Cool. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. so much. It was great. Thank oh, it looks you. like looks like Lena has a question. Oh, Lena, do you have a question? No, it wasn't a question. I hit the wrong uh, reaction. <laughs> I was giving you applause. Okay, well, <laughs> high five. It, it kind of looks like a high five. So high five. <laughs> it was excellent. It was excellent. Thank you so awesome. much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Gretchen. You so Thank Happy you. Thanksgiving, Thank everyone. You. Excellent presentation. Yeah. Excellent Thanks. presentation. Excellent delivery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent Thank delivery. You. See you. See you on the square. I'll see you on the square. <laughs> Take care.